Matthew, is there anyone that celebrates Christmas music before December 1st? Half of America. That's an official statistic. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <clears throat> if I can begin with a confession, uh, not all of my ideas are great ideas. And last month I decided that some of the men of our church should hike uh, to the round ball. Uh, on Rome Mountain. It seemed like a, a decent idea when I first uh, thought about it. You know, we could even have dads bring their boys and it'll be an adventure. Um, it was an adventure. It certainly was. I did not expect, nor was I prepared for the weather uh, that would greet us as we made a right turn uh, to head up to Rome. I was not expecting fallen trees or branches in the road. I was not expecting dense fog on the top, not expecting the constant rain, and certainly not expecting 50 mile an hour uh, wind gust. And so already at the parking lot and no turning back. And so some of the East River Park men and their boys um, hiked to the top. And as we came out of the clearing, the wind just slammed onto us um, on the trail. It was difficult to walk without stumbling, difficult to keep your footing. And as the wind hit, uh, poor uh, Daniel Birchfield's son, if you know him, uh, Dean, he'd fall over into the mud. So a little sweet three-year-old Dean would fall over into the mud and hop back up and the wind would knock him down and he'd hop back up. And so whether you're a three-year-old or a grown man, it certainly was an interesting hike, but even in the middle of some pretty dangerous wind, um, we stood at the top. And so as you can see, we made it there without too much complaining. Most of the complaining was me, but um, we made it to the top. All right, we can get rid of my face. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a lot of face. Um, it's interesting that even something like the wind can cause such a great force. It's interesting that even something invisible could cause such a power that would, would knock you to the ground. It's, it's interesting that even something like the wind would cause you to struggle to stand. And as you might already know where I'm going, if we struggle to stand against the wind, I promise you we will struggle and fail to stand before the holy God. I mean, is it not what we've already heard from Hannah in the temple in 1 Samuel 2 too? There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There's no rock like our God. Is it not what King David declares in the Psalms? Psalm 96, verse 7, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering. Come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness and tremble before Him all the earth. Oh, our, our God is high and lifted up. Our God is above every name. Our God is powerful and mighty. Our God is sovereign over all. Our God is holy. Who can stand? Like who, who this morning could stand before the holy God? It's the same question asked by the people in 1 Samuel 6, verse 20, and the same question we will ask today. Who can stand before the holy God? So we'll begin in 1 Samuel 6 as we find the answer to that question. Um, if you have a digital Bible, I'll read it out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, it's all over the bulletin because there's a lot of scripture uh, this morning. But before we read the account, let's pray together. Father, we uh, come before you in your holiness, and God, forgive us for doing so, so casually. God, for, forgive us for gathering in a church in East Tennessee and not even beginning to think about your sovereignty, your power, your might. God, forgive us for the um, arrogance that we have, Father. The arrogance to think that we could even stand before you on our own. 
God, teach us from your word. God, give us uh, understanding from the account in 1 Samuel 6. Uh, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Let me read the, the full account of what's going on uh, today. This is 1 Samuel 6. I'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us what, what we shall send it to its place. They said, If you send the ark away of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering, and then you'll be healed. And it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, Well, what's the, what's the guilt offering that we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden tumors and five golden mice. According to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. And so you must take images of the tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did he, did he not send the people away and they departed? Now take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there had never come a yoke and a yoke the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put in a box at its side the figures of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off. Let it go its way and watch. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done to us uh, this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. So the men did so. And they took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their cows at home, calves at home. They put the ark of the Lord in the cart and the box and the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, the lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines, they went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and they saw the ark and they rejoiced to see it. The ark of the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there. They split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which there were golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw it, will they return to Ekron? These are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Eshkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden, golden mice, according to the number of the cities of the Philistines, belong to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages, the great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord as a witness to this day, in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 of them down, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. The men of Beth, Beth Shemesh said, who, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? To whom shall he go away from us, up away from us? And so they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerem saying, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. And the men of kiriath Jerem came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From that day, the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerem a long time past, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Who can stand before the holy God. For the past several weeks, 
we've watched both parties attempt that task. The Israelites were devastated by the enemy on the battlefield. The Philistines hauled off the ark of God only to be struck with tumors and death. So as we begin 1 Samuel 6, we'll see the end result of those attempts. We'll see the outcome of the ark of God. We will see the final fall of judgment on God's people before Samuel steps into the light. So who can stand before the holy God? Let, let's start with two answers. Number one, it's not the person who gives offering. Not the person who gives offering. Seven months. That's how long the Philistines kept the ark. Seven months of plagues and pain and sorrow and death. Why, why keep it seven months, right? Why not get rid of that thing as soon as it caused problems in their life? Well... Part of the answer is that our sin is, is such a blinding reality that even when we become self-destructive in our behavior, we continue just to be headstrong down the path. Seven months seems ridiculous until we realize that most of us tend to harm ourselves with sin for far too longer than it really needs to be. But after seven months... The Philistines, they call on the priest and the diviners to intervene, which should be a clue to us that this, this intervention is not starting off on the right foot. The Philistines have chosen what is evil to confront the holy God in his ark. This is from Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 9. It says, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow or you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or anyone who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations to the Lord your God is driving them out before you. The Philistines, they call on the priests and those that try to contact spirits in the dead to figure out the plan. What are we going to do with this ark? Tell us where we should send this thing. So they responded, well, don't send it back to Israel without a guilt offering. So if you, if, if you send a guilt offering and you're healed, then you'll know that the heavy, why the heavy hand of the Lord was on you. So the next logical question is, well, what kind of guilt offering? So they responded, well, five golden tumors to represent the five Philistine cities, and then five golden mice to represent the plague that came on those five cities. Make these images and then give glory to the Lord. Maybe then he'll leave us alone. Seriously, y'all. Why harden your hearts like the Egyptians and the Pharaoh did? Do you remember how well that went when they wouldn't send God's people away? What did they, what did they get right in all that? Um, well, they knew that the Lord would require a guilt offering for their sin. That's in Leviticus 5, starting in verse 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally and in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock valued in silver shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary for a guilt offering. So they know they need a guilt offering. They got that part right. They also know that they, they shouldn't harden their hearts like the Egyptians did and the Pharaoh did. Well, they got that part right. What didn't they get right? Well, they're using the priests and the diviners to call the shots. They aren't following the guilt offering requ requirements of, uh, required of Leviticus. And worst of all, they create images of tumors and mice. So one for Ashdod, one for Gath, one for Eshkelon, 
one for um, Gaza and one for Ekron. F so five mice to represent the five cities. Five mice to represent the disease that was spread to cause tumors. They created images. Again, a problem, Deuteronomy 4, verse 16. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that's on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that's in the water under the sea or the earth. Um, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, you should be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Wicked men of the Philistines have created these images as a guilt offering before the Lord. Friends, um, your offerings will not appease the holy God of Israel. The guilt offering of the Philistines, certainly wicked and a false offering before the Lord, filled with images that had nothing to do with the Levitical law. The holy God of Israel will not be purchased by what we bring to the table or simply like you can't buy God with your good works or your money. Our offerings will not cause us to stand before the holy God. It actually says this in Isaiah 64, verse 6. We have all become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf in our iniquities, like the wind that takes us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and you have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Christianity... Um, it is full of people that really believe they can buy favor with God through their good works. Christianity is full of people that really believe that good people go to heaven and then bad people go to hell. That is a false Christianity with a false promise of eternity, that our good works are really an overflow of our faith, but it's not the object of our faith, because the object of our faith is a person named Christ Jesus. So when we buy into this lie that we can buy favor with God in His holiness, we are becoming a part of the self-fulfilling prophecy of Isaiah 64. Men and women that think they are good enough for God, and God will have them melt in the hand of their iniquities. Do you really believe um, that your offering of good works and the money that you give, that it actually buys you favor with God? Do you know how exhausting it is to live like that? To always be some, playing some balancing game with your sins and good, good works. To always be trying to just add enough good works so you can tip the scales back in your favor with God. Do you know how exhausting it is to live like that? Of course you do. Because you tend to live like that all the time. We all tend to live like that at times. God is not some cheap holiday special. God is not some manager's discount. God is not for sale. God is holy and your sins can't be purchased by your offerings. Who can stand before the holy God? Well, it's not the person who gives the offering. And here's the most terrifying truth of that statement. It might actually work for a season. Your offerings will often work for a season. So be a good person. Life will usually go well for you. Um, be generous with what you have. It'll make you feel good. The danger is that offerings do actually work for a season. The danger is that offerings, even false offerings, can cause your life to be better at times. It certainly did for the Philistines and in the temporary, they loaded up that ark. They attached a wooden box filled with golden images. They attached two cows to the ark to haul it away. They sent the ark back to a place called Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh is a, a Canaanite city 
a northern border of Judah's territory. It, it actually means the house or the temple of Shemash, which is a Canaanite sun god. Beth Shemesh was one of the towns of Judah granted to the Levites. That'll be good for us to remember. So here's their thought. All right, let's send this thing back, two milk cows and the ark back to Israel. And if the cows don't turn back home to their calves, well, then we'll know that all of this is from God. And as you can see in verse 12, that kind of worked. Those cows went straight along the highway. Uh, the lords of the Philistines, they tracked the ark back, back to Beth Shemesh. The greatest and scariest reality is that their offering sort of worked for a little while. At least the tumor stopped. At least the plagues and the death stopped when the guilt offering was sent away with the ark. But do we really believe that the Philistines now have favor with God? Do we really believe that the Philistines were now, they're now God's people because they've offered some offering? Of course not, because the offering we give doesn't get it done. Well then, what about a sacrifice? What if we give a sacrifice? Who can stand before the holy God? Sorry to tell you, point two, it's not the person who gives sacrifice. It's not the person who gives sacrifice. So the ark arrives in the town as the people were reaping the wheat harvest in the valley. It's a miracle. They lifted up their eyes and they rejoiced. Everything's, everything's going to be okay. The presence of the Lord has returned. Hope had arrived. And so they did what they thought was right. They took the ark to a great stone. They took the golden images out of the box. They killed the cows as a sacrifice to the Lord. Everything was right. Everything's back to normal. Until we get to verse 19 and everything goes wrong. In verse 19, we find that the Lord struck down at least 70 men. 70 men. Most of the Hebrew manuscripts actually say that the Lord struck down 50,000 men because of their sin. What did they do? Well, first, they sacrificed cows instead of a bull. Leviticus 1 verse 3. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. Second, they sacrificed out in the field and then not in the tabernacle. Lastly, as the text says, they just looked upon the ark that should have been out of sight in the tabernacle. All of that comes from a town of a Levite priest that should have known better. So what was a day of celebration? It turned into this haunting reality for Israel, prompting the men of Beth Shemesh to ask this question in verse 20 that we must answer today. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Israel stood against the Philistines and there was a great defeat. 34,000 men died. And now they can't, like, they can't even stand before their own God. I mean, even after giving sacrifice, God cut them down. I mean, sure, yeah, they didn't get it perfectly right, but couldn't, couldn't God show them a little grace? They didn't have the tent of meeting, the tabernacle in front of them. Um, I'd say they probably didn't have it at all at this point. They didn't have a bull before them. They had milking cows to sacrifice. Wasn't that good enough? I mean, couldn't this loving God show them a little grace? At least 70 men 
dead, the ark was taken to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerim, a city northwest of Jerusalem, placed in the house of Abinadab on the hill. A priest named Elie Eleazar was consecrated to take care of the ark. And so some 20,000 years, or 20,000 20, years passed. The entire house of Israel lamented after the Lord. The ark was home. But Israel was killed and wounded in their sin. Who can stand before the holy God? Not even men that give sacrifice. Do you really believe that your sacrifice will allow you to stand before this holy God? What about all that you sacrifice for the church? What about all those that you sacrifice to serve those around you? What about all the gifts that you sacrifice for the good of East River Park in this community? Do you really believe that your sacrifice will be any different than the Levites of Beth Shemesh? Matthew 7, verse 22, And on that day, many will come to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare it to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Friends, the truth is, neither our offering or our sacrifice will let us stand before the Holy God. There's nothing that you and I can bring to the table that will allow us to stand before this God. Eighth grade year um, of junior high, I, I tried out for our school basketball team. And about, I played basketball my whole life. Uh, I was a pretty athletic kid, and should, really should be no reason I couldn't make uh, the middle school basketball team of Woodford County, Kentucky. And I went through the tryouts. Everything seemed like it went well. Um, certainly wasn't the best and wasn't the worst. And coach said that he would... Uh, post the roster who made the team outside of the gym that week. Um, so the day that the roster arrived, my father drove me to school that morning. And he said he would walk in with me and check out the list. He played ball with me in the driveway. Maybe he already knew that my name wasn't going to be on that list. And so he's just trying to be... Uh, more, show some moral support. And so we walked in and both looked at that list and I stared at reality. Jason Payne was nowhere to be found. And I, I wasn't good enough to make, to make the team. And it, it hurt my uh, insecure eighth grade heart. And dad tried to offer some encouragement after the news. And that same feeling haunts our relationship with God. As if we treat the Lamb's Book of Life as a basketball roster. A constant, nagging feeling of just never being good enough. Just try a little more. Just do a little more. Just be a little better. It's the reason why so many people hate church. Or churches, they're just hammering away at people. Do more. Do more. Do more. You're not good enough. I mean, no wonder people walk away from a false understanding of Christianity. Because here's the most freeing truth I can offer this morning. The worst news that you can hear. The worst news is that you can be good enough. And you're not. So keep trying. The best news is that you can't be good enough, but Christ Jesus makes a way. You and I are not good enough to stand before the Holy God. Like every offering, every sacrifice we give is not good enough for a Holy God. 
R.C. Sproul, he once said, the, the logic of the Bible is this, since no one has a perfect heart, no one does a perfect deed. That we can't stand before the Holy God with hands full of tainted offerings and sacrifices. We can only stand before the Holy God with a clean heart. That's the main point. Who can stand before the Holy God? Point three, the person with a clean heart. Psalm 51, verse 15, O Lord, open my lips, my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I'll give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering, the sacrifices of God, or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Friends, God wants your heart. He wants your desires and your will. He wants your entire heart over sacrifices, over offerings. God wants your heart. Isaiah 1, verse 5. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. Later on in verse 13. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They become a burden to me and I'm, I'm weary of bearing them. The whole heart is faint. Vain offerings and sacrifices will not do. What should we do later on in verse 18? Come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. The question isn't who wants to stand before the Holy God. Oh, you don't have a choice in that matter. We will either stand before the Holy God and be cut down, or we will stand before the Holy God made righteous through the work of Christ. The question really is, do you have a clean heart? End with Acts 15, verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Do you have a clean heart? If you want to talk about anything after uh, the service, you want to know the answer to that question, do you have a clean heart? I uh, would love to talk with you. Um, I'd love to pray with you, but let's... Let's pray and then we'll sing a closing song. Father, we, we come before you and in and, and confession. How many of us and how often we try to make ourselves right with you in our own power. And how exhausting it is and how frustrating it is. Never feeling good enough. The truth of the Bible is that none of us can stand right before a holy God on our own. And we bring nothing to the table. It is only through the work of Christ. And so by faith, you make our hearts clean. God, help us to be reminded of, of the gospel reality and truth uh, that even 1 Samuel 6 reminds us of. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.